Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Vice President of Product Marketing for Salesforce, Sarah Varney. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Welcome to everyone who's just joining us here for the afternoon. We've got an action-packed afternoon ending with Ariana Huffington. We are, we're super excited for the programming. Um, but now I have a very interesting speaker. This speaker gives a whole new meaning to sales intelligence. We have Robin Dreek, who's joining us from the FBI. Um, for nearly the past two decades, Robin has been focused on their behavioral psychology program, focused on driving behavior through negotiation and through influence. And today we're lucky to have him here at Sales Machine to talk about how he does this and to unpack it for the audience so that you can take back some of these best practices to the office, straight from the FBI. So here we go. I'd like to welcome Robin Dreek onto the Sales Machine stage. Hey, afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? I apologize. I had to bring my water with me. Um, just got over a cough, so hopefully I can, it's only 25 minutes. We can hold up, I hope, right? Um, so I, I'm going to do a few things first for you. I'm going to frame very briefly my background of this type A hardcore narcissist uh, that I was 20 years ago and, and talk of in terms of how that really wasn't very helpful for what it was I was supposed to do for really my entire life and every aspect of it. So I'm going to give you um, basic framing and a, a really very, very actionable set of my five steps of trust that I do in every single situation in my life, whether it's um, been my full-time job with the FBI recruiting spies, um, recruiting my bosses to leave me alone because my ultimate goal at work is always leave me alone um, and let me help people who want to be helped. And most importantly, I have two teenagers, well, almost uh, a 20-year-old now, uh, college and uh, high school. And I tell you, if you can communicate effectively and inspire trust with your teenagers and they hand you your cell, their cell phones and you can start texting for them to their friends, uh, you got it down. Anyway, how to build tr uh, trust rapport with anyone. So in essence, I really have been in sales most of my life and didn't even realize it because especially when I, so I was actually born here in Manhattan. I uh, grew up just north of here in Putnam County, and uh, so I'm a United States Naval Academy graduate. I went in the Marine Corps, and from the Marine Corps, I went in the FBI in 1997. Um, and if that doesn't scream type A, hard-charging guy, I don't know what does. And so I, also, I thought I had this natural-born leadership in me. Um, and what I found, especially in the last couple years when I started putting this code together, was there's a massive difference between trying to convince someone of something, which in reality you really can't. You know, how many times do we sit there arguing context, what, what some, you know, you have a thought and opinion about something, and if I don't agree with it, the first thing I'm going to do is tell you what I think about your thought and opinion, I'm going to try to give you mine. You know, so even if that's your goal to, you know, get your thoughts into their mind or get them to take an action on your behalf, we spend so much time trying to convince people that we're right rather than reversing it and thinking in terms of how can I inspire them to want to. If I want them to hear what I want to say, if I want to have them listen to my sales pitch, if I want them to, if I want my teenagers to listen to me, I don't think in terms of how can I convince them. I think in terms of how can I inspire them to want to. Um, and that is the key of everything I do because that's going to then mold our language to support what it is we're trying to achieve and accomplish. So how did this all come about? So when I was about yay big, uh, we had a very good friend of our family. Um, th this guy was a uh, United Airlines pilot. I thought he was pretty dang cool. He had flown uh, A4 Skyhawks in the Navy during Vietnam. He flew off the Kearsarge. His I Love Me room was the coolest dang thing I'd ever seen. So right from that point on, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, an astronaut, and I wanted to fly jets in the Navy. Um, my, my ideal, what I thought leadership was uh, growing up was like what I saw, you know, Patton and all these other generals and everything where, you know, their leadership style I saw exhibited was kick someone in the ass, poke them in the eye, and you're a leader. Way off. <laughs> you know, so and I, I, had, I, I, mean, I, I could go on, you know, all the life lessons of ego, of ego humbling moments I had, you know, that, that got me to understand that's not it. And, and if you have that type of personality, you know, you have these great moments of brilliance and great failures, great moments, you know, up and down like this. Well, when I came in the FBI, uh, what I discovered was um, you gotta, there's a different way to do things if you want to you know, inspire someone to want to help the United States rather than try to hurt it. Um, so I discovered this reality back when I was still in the Marine Corps, and that is there's this massive disconnect between that which we think we're projecting to the rest of the world and that which the rest of the world actually sees when they see us. And the more self-aware you are about what that is, 
and with honesty, the better off you're going to be. Here I thought I was, you know, this great Marine, great friend to everyone at my first duty station down at Cherry Point, North Carolina. And lo and behold, the middle of the night, I'm sitting there in my sleeping bag over, up over my head and I'm on a cot. Oh, I hear my friends in the tent all of a sudden, a little shuffling, a little laughing, and snickering, all of a sudden, I'm getting duct tape inside my cot. It's like, huh, this is interesting. And all of a sudden, they get lifting me up and they moving me out. And like 20, 30 minutes later, they set me down. And I was able to pop my hand out the top and I had my Leatherman multi-tool. I cut myself out and I popped my head out and I looked. It's like, wow, I'm in the middle of where we're dropping bombs the next day. That's a clue. Uh, a little disconnect between what you know, I thought I was presenting and what the rest of the world sees. And so when I came in the Bureau, what I found was I started asking myself these questions. You know, a lot of times I got to do a lot of interviews. I got to do a lot of talking to people, whether it's people at work, coworkers, friends, colleagues, my teenagers, whatnot. And so I'm always thinking in terms of why should anyone want to talk to me? Not why I think they should want to talk, but why do they think they want to talk? And that's where my process starts hitting because I got to keep reversing it. Why should anyone want to tell me anything? Why should they ever want to see me again? Because the goal of every meeting is, a, is what? A second meeting. You know, and if not, even if someone doesn't want to have a continual relationship for whatever it is that you're trying to do, branding for me is, is number one because even if they walk away want, not wanting to engage, I want them to feel better for having met me and so my words are going to support that no matter what. And Why should anyone want to take actions for me? Then ultimately leadership is why should anyone want to follow you and that's you know, follow a brand or anything else. So, what I discovered when I came here to New York, and, and this is generally what I did, I worked right down here at 26 Federal Plaza. In the world of counterintelligence that I've spent my entire career um, doing is if ever, and this was a challenge I never really understood happened, is I sold that, you know, I, I sold the concept and idea that, you know, protecting the United States is a great idea, even though it might, you might suffer personal, you know, retribution about it or professional, that it was just something that was good thing, good idea to do, even though it's not going to benefit you in any way, it, it's a good idea to do. And then ultimately, you know, I worked against uh, Russian military intelligence. According to their code and training, if they are ever approached, you know, where I took the initiative by any American, they automatically assumed you were intelligence and they never spoke to you again. So here's my job. I have to inspire someone to want to talk to me and create a relationship with me where I can't make the first contact. So that's what I've done for 20 years and so that's how I came up with this code because you either do your job or you fail. Uh, luckily I was surrounded by some fantastic mentors and guides. Uh, I call them my, uh, I got the Jedi mind arts here. Uh, these guys worked 25 years doing just this uh, and I learned from them because I was not a natural born leader, I was a natural born ass. And so because that, that type A really came out hard charging where I was just too much energy and too much in the face and it just did not resonate well at all. And so. This is Kennedy's, um, back, I'm, I don't think it's here anymore, I think it's like on 48th Street right over here. It's my first meeting I went with my Jedi Master and we we're going to talk to a great American patriot. This guy w potentially was going to uh, help out, um, help out against, you know, adversaries that don't have our country's best interests at heart. And I remember we sat down at this meeting and um, all John said was, just say nothing and listen. I said, okay. And John had one opening line. And this guy, David, started talking and talking and talking. He's talking about his divorce. He's talking about childcare custody issues. He's talking about how he's going to get funding to finish his PhD at Columbia. And uh, three and a half hours later, it's like, what the heck is going on? We're not talking about anything having to do with work. Next thing I know is David looks at his watch and goes, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I took all your time, guys. What can I do to help you guys? I like, oh, that was easy. The guy just volunteered. What I didn't realize at the time was it was an art form that I was being taught. And so later on, I, I took over our behavioral analysis program, so I ran, I was the chief of the behavioral analysis program for the FBI, for the nation, uh, in the world, in the area of counterintelligence. And when I started putting the psychology behind the practical application on the street, this is, what I, this is the fundamental thing I, I learned and remain in my head all the time, and that is I'm always thinking in terms of brain rewards. Neuroscience. When we are, we're ancient tribal people and when we are part of a tribe, it meant that we are accepted, it meant our survival, we shared food, we shared resources, we shared everything we need in order to, um, to survive and procreate. We're hardwired for it. So when people do actions and exhibit language that is saying that we accept you non-judgmentally for who we are, our brain rewards us with dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin in the bloodstream, all the pleasure centers are firing with non-judgmental validation and, and this acceptance theme. And anytime you hear language like that, it is what resonates very strongly. I mean, who's ever had that conversation with someone and you thought you had to go in five or ten minutes or they said they did and yet it went on and on and on because what's going on is you're talking and sharing your thoughts and opinions and they weren't being judged. And when that happens, our brain says this person is good for our survival and so we want to keep continuing. And so now that's what we're going to wrap everything around when we're communicating. And so the first step that I do in my process after I discovered this was, you know, in anything in life, I set goals. 
And for me, goals are very, very different. I don't set um, different in the sense that when I was young, you know, my goal was become this great military leader, and because I want to be, my ultimate goal was I want to be a great leader. So, but I defined it very narrowly. I said I want to be a naval aviator, I want to be an astronaut, and uh, maybe a Marine Corps general, something like that. Meanwhile, I failed at all of them because they're means goals. I don't have a lot of control over those, but the ends goals, in other words, the leadership, that's a state of mind. And so I always make sure that I ha understand my state of mind with everyone. My ends goal with absolutely every human being I interact with is healthy relationship. Happy, healthy relationship. Number two for me is open, honest communication. Because if I have that, I'm gonna have situational awareness for everything that's going on, and they're gonna be feel free to share their goals and priorities with me and what their context are, so I can always make sure I'm talking in terms of them. And down from there is when I start prioritizing the other things, you know, like promotion, sales, whatever it is, uh, I always start out with those end states of two. I will never do anything out of this mouth or action that's gonna compromise happy, healthy relationship or open, honest communication. And that works very well with teenagers as well. Number two for me, so that's it, after that, after I set the goal, I always think in terms of, so why should they? If my goal is to have my teenagers take an action, I always think, so why should they? You know, coworkers, confidential human sources, spies, I don't care what it is. I set that goal, then I reverse it. So why should they? So I gotta start thinking in terms of them. First thing I do is I ascertain their priorities. Goals, dreams, aspirations, challenges in life, needs, wants, and priorities. What makes this person get up and live another day? If I can't find it out ahead of time through social media sites, then you can find out a lot through that. I'll find out in that first conversation. In other words, I won't even start anything or have any kind of dialogue or conversation until I understand what their goals and priorities are. That is, that is my ultimate thing to start with because I always have to talk in terms of those because as long as I'm talking in terms of their priorities, their brain is rewarding them, guaranteed. I call, I call it sex, drugs, rock and roll, chocolate, and non-judgmental validation. It's all doing the same thing in the brain, so I always wanna make sure I'm talking in terms of those. So after I understand what their priorities are, I have to understand what their context is, what, how they see the world through their life optic from their particular vision point, whether it's um, based on ethnicity, gender, um, demographic in the country, social, uh, economic status, all these things I have to understand what they see when they see me, because I gotta make sure I'm using language that is building trust between the two. And from there, I'm just gonna start putting this together, understanding what my goals and priorities are. I didn't have to try to achieve my goals. It's, it's, I call it my new car effect. I bought a Toyota Tundra a couple years ago. I'm from Virginia, so we all got trucks. Okay. I bought a Toyota Tundra a couple years ago, and the day I bought my Tundra, I swear, I think 300 people in my town bought my same truck. It's that new car effect. It, you give it a label and meaning, and you never have to think about it again. The same thing with your goals. If you give it a label and meaning, you don't have to try to do it, because if you try to force your goal and agenda, become a manipulator. If you allow the process to happen with patience, and you take care of the relationship, it'll happen at the tempo the other person's comfortable with and then it's all about them. So when you put these things together, here's the language I use. I make sure when I'm crafting, and I call crafting because I, I craft emails, I craft encounters, because I want to make sure that what I'm hardwired to be is that narcissistic, megalomaniac guy. I want to make sure I can override my, my desire to make it all about me. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I make sure every statement is about them. I, when I'm, if I can't, and there's a lot of times you can completely rework a statement so it's about them, and I'll show you here an example of how I do that with my phraseology then I don't even say it. Uh, two, speak in terms of their priorities, because uh, understanding that I already know what their priorities are. After that, I'm gonna seek thoughts and opinions. You know, say that one of my goals and objectives is that I want you to listen to what I have to say. Well, now I gotta think and reverse it, so why should you wanna listen to what I have to say? Well, the way that you might wanna listen to it is, one, I seek your thoughts and opinions first. So what do you think about X, Y, and Z? And you start sharing, and every time you start sharing, your brain's rewarding you, I then will validate that content. I say, wow, I never really thought about it quite that way before. Help me understand how did you come up with that. Shields continue to low, lower. Now if I want you to, my content, I say, oh, I was curious, you know, now what do you think about this? All I'm doing is asking questions and I'm validating that judgmentally the entire time as opposed to you have your thoughts and opinions and I, and I say, huh, all okay, right, but here's what I really think. You see the difference? The goal is exactly the same. I want you to hear what I have to say but you reverse it and thinking in terms of so why should they want to. So that's what I'm making, seeking thoughts and opinions. I love seeking thoughts and opinions. Empower people with choices regarding their priorities. I never give advice, I never tell people what they should do. I ask a lot of questions, I seek thoughts and opinions, and then I, I give choice. People don't like being told what to do ever. You know, try it with your kids, try it with anyone, they don't like it. So I always kind of, and I always frame these choices. Do, I'm sure we've all done this. You give people choices, are you not giving them choices that are totally aligned with what your goals are as well? 
Absolutely. So always do choice. I remember I worked for a Marine Corps colonel once years and years ago, and he said, never tell me no, only tell me yes. But tell me what it'll cost me. So he could feel like he could always make a choice. And now, when I always gave a cost-benefit analysis, was it always in favor of the things I was hoping to try to do as well? Absolutely. So next, this is the toughest one in the world. S suspend your ego and vanity. I guarantee that when you create yourself a humbling moment in life, and we all have them, I wake up every morning and I pray I, I don't create another humbling, uh, humbling moment today, you've done it. There's something about your ego, your insecurities, because we all have insecurities, that came out of this mouth or out of that typed email that caused that humbling moment. Very, very rarely are things personal. You just triggered the insecurities of someone else on you. So I really, really hard, very deeply assess what did I do to cause this. And that, is, that takes a massive amount of ego, um, suspension, and lack of vanity. People do not People don't respond to title and position. They do out of fear for title and position, but they re they, people respond to how you treat them, nothing more. So finally, I call crafting the encounter, and, and there's lots of ways you can do this. You know, think about who, who's the best person to do it, or who, how do I need to modify myself, my, my, what I'm wearing, you know, any kind of jewelry, you know, what kind of impression do, do I need to give off to, that they want to see in order to still trust? The where. Where is always most important, you know, is it you want to do this in a boardroom, you want to do it at a coffee shop, you want to do it at a fine restaurant. Think and contemplate not what you want to do, but what makes them comfortable that their shields are going to be lowered. When, what time of day? You know, hitting people first thing on a Monday morning or last thing on a Friday afternoon might not be the best idea. Show some patience. Patience is the number one thing that gets in the way of success when branding and doing anything, I think. Uh, and then finally, the how. What is your opening statement? And that opening statement is going to make sure that you include their priorities, their context, seeking thoughts and opinions, and empowering with choice in some way. I only craft that opening round. I call it the opening round because they call it in the fog of war. They said after the first round goes down range, all hell breaks loose and there's no more plan. Uh, so I only plan the opening, the opening statement. That is it. There's no memorization with this process. There's a core understanding of what we each desire and need as human beings. That's all I'm doing. So here's the format I use when I'm crafting. I always, always will start out with a specific non-judgmental validation of a strength, attribute, or action of that other person. I've had many times someone has said to me, Robin, you know, so and so is a mess. Go fix him. I said, well, I need time. I said, time for what? I said, I got to wait to see and learn about his strengths because everyone's got them. And it might not be at work. I work with a guy right now. Um, he's like me. He's not, I'm a horrible case agent. <laughs> I'm good at talking to people, I'm horrible. I, you know, give me an investigation, I absolutely hate it. I like talking to people. This guy, he's, he's a train wreck as well, but he can't really admit he's a train wreck. <laughs> you know, and that's fine. But in order to wait to see and you know, have a great conversation where shields are down, I had to learn about him. And what I learned was this guy is a phenomenal father and a phenomenal husband. You know, and so those are the things that you validate, you seek thoughts and opinions about to get the shields down. And you can only do that if you understand what your, what your ultimate goal is, and that is to get shields down, information in. Then, oh, and it's back to the first one as well, it's got to be truthful. I do not lie. You want to you break trust and rapport down? Lie. Human beings are phenomenally good at detecting the difference between this and what you feel in here. We're sales. We've all been creeped out by creepy salespeople from time to time because there's incongruence between what's coming out, per saying the perfectly right things. But if you don't feel it in here, feeling, in other words, that I'm here actually for you, that's where that incongruence happens, that's where the creepiness happens. Ancient mammalian brain that it, man has, very, very perceptive on these things. So that's why when I'm using these validations of strengths and attributes, it's got to be true and it's got to be real from their context. Next, seek thoughts and opinions regarding their priorities. What's important to them? And I'm asking them their priorities about it and their thoughts and opinions. Because again, that's going to get the brain rewarding them for that engagement. They're going to want to continue to dialogue with me. Whatever that thought and opinion is, their context, I'm going to validate it. Doesn't mean I'm going to agree with it, I'm going to validate it. Saying I understand, help me, help me understand how you came up with that. When did you come up with that? Why did you decide to do it that way? In not a challenging way, but an accepting way. Then I'm going to seek their thoughts and opinions regarding my context. In other words, if I have information, I have a thought and opinion that I would like them to listen to or an idea, then I'm going to, I do that by this process and then I'm going to get them to do that because by asking them their thoughts and opinions about it. Brain is continually rewarding. And every statement in here, I go line by line. Is this about them? To make it about them, you have to validate strengths, seek thoughts and opinions, validate context, and power of choice. Those are the only things I'm doing nonstop. 
Then what I'm going to do is, as I see the opportunity, because I know what my goals and objectives are, I now understand what their goals and objectives and priorities are. I'm now going to empower with choice on their goals, objectives, and priorities, and obviously they're going to be aligned with mine. I will not, it, we're, we're coded, we're not going to do it without it. Now, if you start to intentionally do it, if you're on a timeline, you're going to start coming off as, I'm not saying right or, there is no right or wrong, there's just a massive cause and effect. I can guarantee you, this is, this, this is very predictive behavior. I can guarantee you if you don't do these things, the chances of their shields and walls being up is much greater. I can't guarantee the result, but what I can guarantee is that you can have a much more productive conversation than, than you otherwise would have had when you're thinking in terms of this, and I can guarantee that if you do this, the shields are going to be down. Again, I can't say what someone's going to do, what action they're going to take, but in the last, I came up with this code probably about five years ago. I've been working this stuff, you know, on the street, still am, I'm a street agent, you know, I got two years till I retire. There hasn't been one means goal along the way that I, hasn't been achieved. I focus on those ends goals, the happy, healthy relationship. Now, is it the timing that I wanted? Is it on the tempo? Is it, you know, no, a lot of times it requires patience, a lot of patience. And if you don't have time for patience, that's fine. Just realize that there's going to have a cause and effect. Again, no right or wrong. You just have a lot of predictive behavior when you do this. Then the final thing I do, and people, people at my job, they, they can't believe I do this. If you don't want to talk to me, let me know and I will leave you alone. That's, that's the final empower choice. And you know what? I have never had anyone tell me, get away from me. Even people that hate the United States government, that's fine. I validated it. I said, you probably don't want to be bothered by another guy from the government just like me, and I completely understand. If that's the case, please just let me know, email me back, and I'll, I'll make a note never to bother you again. Because the people that want to force it, insecurities. I'm secure. If you're just not meant to cross paths with me, I understand. And it's okay. I wanted to keep on time. Because one thing that you want to do when you're facilitating and chatting with uh, friends, colleagues, and peers is entertain. I, I hope you know, some of this has somewhat you know, generated a, a laughter or a chuckle because you generally remember things more when you do. Tools, and that's the most important thing is that hopefully you can see some actionable things in here when it came, comes, if nothing else, phraseology and ways to think about inspiring versus convincing. And uh, short, you know, I'm under the time, which is good for everyone. Um, this is my website. Um, peopleformula.com, you can email me through there uh, easily. It comes right to my Gmail account. Also, my Twitter handle is at Dreek, I mean at rdreek, so it's at R-D-R-E-E-K-E. -E. I love strategizing trust, I love strategizing engagements, and uh, if you reach out, uh, I'll, I'll say, hey, great to hear from you again. When did I last see you? If you want to reference this, that'd be great. Um, Anyway, that's been it, guys. I hope, uh, hope it was helpful. Hope, um, hope you have a great rest of the conference and kick off to the afternoon. Thanks a lot.